Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are two of the most ambitious Pokemon games ever produced. But they're also pretty divisive due to, um, stuff like this. Whatever your feelings are on these two games though, it's universally agreed that they're some of the best titles in which you can hunt for shinies. But that does come with a catch. In Let's Go Pikachu, shiny Pokemon would sparkle in the overworld, and then in Legends Arceus, we got both that sparkle as well as a jingle to alert us to a shiny Pokemon in the area. But in Scarlet and Violet, we don't get any of that. In this game, you have to concentrate pretty intensely sometimes to spot the elusive shiny you've been searching for or risk missing it altogether. Due to the sheer amount of Pokemon on screen and the ability to influence encounters through the use of sandwiches, you're more likely to find a shiny Pokemon than ever before. But the question remains, can you keep your concentration long enough to find it? It's an interesting dynamic and as you'll see, it's one that I had a lot of fun with. So with all that said, please enjoy Pokemon Scarlet, but I can only use shinies. Before we do jump into the video though, there are just two small points to cover. First of all, in keeping with tradition here on the channel, every single shiny Pokemon that I catch during this challenge will be given away to one lucky viewer as a thank you. To enter the raffle, you'll just need a copy of Scarlet or Violet with a Nintendo Online membership, or a Pokemon Home membership, as well as a Discord account so that we can communicate while trading, just so that I don't give them away to the wrong person. If you'd like to enter, all you need to do is leave a comment with a Pokemon story from one of your own playthroughs, as I always love hearing about those. You don't need to subscribe or like the video to partake in the raffle, but I would appreciate it so much if you'd like to do those things, as it really helps the channel. It looks like 99% of people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed, so improving that would be awesome. Secondly, there aren't many rules for this challenge, but what rules we do have are now displayed on screen. If you'd like to read them, please feel free to pause the video, but all of this information will also be in the description alongside the raffle details. Let's do this. There wasn't too much going on before we could begin our first shiny hunt, but we did get to experience some Skyrim level character customization, as well as meet the new starter Pokemon, which are all unfortunately shiny locked, meaning that we'd need to wait a little bit longer before we could find our first team member. We also get to meet our rival in this game, Nimona, a legendary beast by the name of Coridon that loves sandwiches, and a slightly angry young man named Arvin, who we'll talk more about later. Now, I can already feel the comment section telling me that I've done this wrong, so let me explain. I know that technically I could have hunted for a shiny along Poco Path, but I decided for this run that I would only begin the hunt once we'd beaten Arvin and were able to enter the South Province purely just so that there's more variety in what we could encounter. One of the most fun parts of Paldea is the freedom of it all, so I really didn't want to limit myself this early on, all because of a level 5 Squover and a view of Mesa Goza that only a mother could love. And so, after we climbed back down the lighthouse ladder, our first shiny hunt could finally begin right here in South Province Area 1. So let's talk about what this first hunt involved. The base odds for a Pokemon appearing as shiny in this game are 1 in 4096, and the only method in which I could hunt for a shiny at this stage was through… random encounters. This involved running around on foot, as I didn't have access to Coridon yet, and inspecting all of the Pokemon in each area to see if any had spawned in as a shiny. And while this could have been a very painful hunt, it seems like I was kind of lucky, because after only 3 hours of doing this, I bumped into our first shiny team member. This turned out to be a shiny Lechonk, who we nicknamed Happy, and Lechonk is a Paldean Pokemon that I loved the design of back when it was advertised in all of the promos for the games, so this was a perfect start. Now that we'd caught our first Pokemon though, I decided to progress the story a little more so that I could ride around on Coridon for our next hunt, as running around with our character is kinda painful. After heading to Mesa Goza and answering some questions from children that really need to be investigated by either a doctor or an exorcist, we were able to take on all three of the game's storylines ready for our adventure. And it's important to note that we'll be completing all three of them for this video, so settle in because this is going to be a long one. For now, we were free to explore the Paldea region though, so it was back to shiny hunting, and I wanted at least a couple more team members before taking on the first gym, so I trekked back to South Province Area 1 to see what I could find. 
For these shiny hunts, we're doing the exact same thing as we did with Lechonk at the base rate of 1 in 4096. But the great news is that we can speed things up considerably now that we're able to run around on Coridon. So with all of that in mind, I took the exact same route that I did last time, and once again, after only 3 hours of running around, I came across a shiny red bug wandering around in the grass. While it's not great that there's no shiny sparkle or jingle in these games, you see the regular versions of Pokemon so often that when a shiny does pop up, you seem to automatically take notice without much effort, and I can understand why people enjoy the added challenge. With all of that said though, I do have to feel for people who have any sort of visual impairment, because this presents a very real accessibility issue, and I think that's my biggest problem overall with Paldea's take on shinies. Sure, it can be considered difficult or a challenge for someone like me to see some of the shinies, but for people who have a visual impairment, it probably borders on impossible. It just seems unfair when the solution was already presented back in Legends Arceus with the jingle and sparkle. Anyway, we nicknamed our Tarantula Gwen and immediately carried on with our shiny hunting and... Wow, the only word to describe these next two is... Unbelievable. So, I spent 7 hours straight wandering around the same path we always took and found absolutely nothing. And I remember sitting at my PC thinking, oh, that's an entire Saturday wasted, but I'll try for 30 more minutes and then log off. And right as I was about to give up, out of nowhere a shiny Azuril popped up right next to where we caught Happy the Lechonk. Man, shiny hunting really is just this roller coaster of emotions, because you can literally go from agony to ecstasy in a matter of seconds. I nicknamed her Natasha, and bolstered by that catch, I decided to hunt for one more hour, just in case. And I'm really glad that I did, because literally five minutes later, this happened. <laughs> I, I just, I mean, how does this even happen? I go seven hours without finding any, and then I find two in literally five minutes. It's crazy. Anyway, that is an extremely cool shiny, and I'm very grateful that we decided to spend that extra time searching. I nicknamed my shiny Fletchling Pepper, and now that we finally had a little squad, it was time to travel to Cartando to take on the first gym. After a little olive rolling, we passed the gym test, and I also evolved Natasha into a Marl ahead of the battle. I sent her out first, and she managed to take down Katie's Nimble, and then Pepper was able to take out Tarantula before she sent out and terastalized her Teddy Ursa. Thanks to its new bug typing, Pepper was able to hang on with no problems and take it down with only a couple of pecs, so that's badge number one. That was a super easy battle to start things off, but that was always to be expected. Oh, by the way, for this challenge, I followed the guide shown on screen for the order in which to complete the various badges and storylines. It really helped, because whilst Paldea is open world, it unfortunately doesn't scale to the level you're at, which means that there really is a set order in which to beat the game. With that in mind, we immediately set off to earn badge number two for defeating the first Titan Pokemon, Claw. This one was also super easy, as Natasha took it down with several bubble beams on the first stage, before Arvin and his shelter joined us for the second stage. Once again, Natasha pulled through with a couple of bubble beams, and got a little help from shelter along the way to defeat the giant crab, and that's badge number two. It's here that we learn a little more about why Arvin is seeking the various Herba Mystica, and it seems fairly safe to say that whoever he's gathering it for is somewhat unwell especially given how enthusiastic he is once he sees the effect it has on Coridon, but more on that later. Speaking of Coridon, we've now gained the ability to dash, which should make traversal and shiny hunting even faster. The power of a good old sandwich, eh? Applies as much in this game as it does in real life. Before we got back to shiny hunting though, I did want to earn one more gym badge, so it was off to face Brassius, the grass type gym leader. After finding a load of some flora for this town's gym test, we could head inside to take on the leader, and I love that right before we face him in battle, Nimona shows up and almost mocks the older generation's rivals, who used to lie and wait for you to enter a town or area and then ambush you with a battle. Not this time. Heading into the real battle, Brassius led with a Petalil, and so I sent out Pepper to start, who had recently evolved. A couple of flame charges took it down, with us having nearly full HP remaining, and our speed boosted by two stages. 
Smoliv was up next and it met a similar fate, being taken down by a single flame charge and going back into its Pokeball as quickly as it came out. His final Pokemon was Sudowoodo, and because Pepper's Terra type is actually normal, I could Terrastalize her and turn any future 4x super effective hits from Rock Throw into a neutral hit. In addition to that, because he Terrastalizes Sudowoodo into a Grass type, we can also get a super effective hit ourselves with Flame Charge, taking away around one third of its HP. On the following turn, I went for Endure as I thought Trailblaze might KO us which would have given us a max power flail after being left on 1 HP. But unfortunately it left us on 5 HP instead, which is only a 150 base power flail, not 200. As a result, Sudowoodo was left with around 1 third HP remaining after our turn, and Pepper went down. Damn. It was a good idea, but I didn't expect Trailblazers to leave us on anything other than 1 HP. Oh well. Happy came out in her place and with two echoed voices managed to take down Sudowoodo and earn us our badge. And that's yet another one earned with not too much trouble really. So now that we'd gotten a couple of badges under our belt, it was time to return to shiny hunting, but this time I wanted to use a slightly different method. If you weren't already aware, the feature of sandwich making plays a huge part in boosting your shiny odds within these games, and while the level 3 sandwiches that literally boost your shiny odds are only available in the post game by finding Herba Mystica, we can actually use some sandwiches now to give us a better chance of finding a shiny. As we progress and unlock more recipes after each gym badge, there are several level 2 sandwiches which provide the encounter power which increases the amount of species you'll see in your area for that type. In my instance, the Pokemon that I most wanted to hunt for was either a Rookady or a Corvusquire, as Corviknight was a Pokemon that I immediately knew I wanted back when I did the research for this run, because its shiny form is brilliant and it's one that I've never really used before. South Province Area 3 was teeming with these, so I made a sandwich which provided the encounter power level 2 for the flying type, and with those effects in place, virtually all I would see were groups of Rookadi with a lone Corvusquire. Now, while the odds for hunting Pokemon remain at 1 in 4096 because these aren't the sparkling power sandwiches, it does still boost your odds in a sense, because you're seeing more of the Pokemon you want to hunt on screen at all times. And the only real downside to this is if there's more than one species of Pokemon of that type in that area, but we'll see that with the next hunt. For now, let's concentrate on Rookady. Or should I say, Corvusquire. I didn't expect that to be the one that I found, but that's awesome. I nicknamed her Valkyrie, and this took around 3 hours of running around, so about 6 sandwiches total because the powers last for 30 minutes per sandwich. I know most people like to talk about the literal number of encounters they have before finding a shiny, and that makes complete sense and is a cool way to measure things, but I'd prefer to measure mine in time. The main reason being is that it's hard to judge as a casual player how long it takes to find a shiny when the number of encounters is 4500, but if I say that it took me 4 hours, then you've got a better picture of what that was like. Anyway, the next shiny that I wanted to hunt for was a Pawnyard. Unfortunately, once again, we'd unlocked a level 2 encounter sandwich for the dark type, so we could use this same tactic. I stayed in the South Province Area 3 for this hunt. I'm loving these area names, by the way, they're super catchy. But this time it was closer to the riverbank, as I'd seen Ponyard spawning around there earlier on. I made my level 2 encounter sandwich, and this time we got mixed results, which is mainly because of what I talked about earlier with having multiple Pokemon of the same type in one area. It turns out that Stunky also spawns around here, so we were seeing more of both species, which was not a great sign. Regardless, I started to do the usual runaround, spawning and despawning Pokemon, and within just 2 hours we did manage to find a shiny, which was... A Pawnyard! Amazing! I was doubtful we'd find the one we wanted this time, so the relief was real. And it also marked the start of me using Premier Balls to catch Pokemon instead of regular Pokeballs. I nicknamed her Yelena, and funnily enough, Natasha the Azumarill evolved right after the battle, which was a hilarious coincidence given their nicknames. It's also an amazing shiny to have with that beautiful yellow colouring. Anyway, the next and final hunt at this stage was a pretty cool one and a personal favourite of mine for this challenge. 
A Pokemon that I've never really used all that much over the years, despite its first appearance being in the generation I started playing Pokemon, is Houndour, as well as its subsequent evolution, Houndoom. They are such cool Pokemon, and in this game I specifically took note of their early appearance in the Inlet Grotto whilst you're travelling with Coridon, as I wanted to come back for one later. In fact, it's the only Dark type I remember seeing in that entire place, and there were a lot of spawns too. So, we loaded up that same level 2 sandwich for dark type encounters and got to work. And let me tell you, this one was fast. I'd only made one sandwich, and there was around 3 minutes left of it, so it took me just 27 minutes to find this one. That is crazy, especially at the 1 in 4096 odds. But that just goes to show you the power of the sandwich encounters if you're looking for something specific. I nicknamed her Agatha, and after levelling the team up a little, things were really starting to fall into place, although I did box both Happy and Gwen. With our new team assembled, we finally made our way to the next badge, and this one's obtained by beating the second Titan Pokemon, Bombardier. It's also a perfect example of Pokemon Scarlet at its best, as we had to dodge giant falling boulders on our way to the top of the mountain. What a set piece. Upon reaching the top, my plan was to use Pepper to take it on, and this time the Endure Flail strategy worked perfectly. On the first two turns I terrestrialized her and we went for a couple of flame charges to get some damage in, as well as boost our speed. I then went for an Endure to survive a hit on 1 HP, and that gave us a max power flail on the next turn to easily take it down. Stage 2 was somehow even easier, as Arvin arrived with a Nackley to help us out, and as Pepper was still at 1 HP, a max power flail was able to bring the Titan to half health on our very first turn, even without terastalizing. Nackley then brought it into the yellow with a super effective smackdown, and then on the following turn, Bombardier just went for a torment, so Pepper was able to decimate the Titan with one more max powered flail. That was awesome, and although it was pretty lucky because it didn't attack Pepper at all in Stage 2, I do really enjoy strategies involving Endure and moves that increase in power the lower the user's HP is. They're always so satisfying to pull off. Anyway, after Coridon snaffed down our sandwich once more and we gained the ability to surf, we were able to learn a little bit more about Arvin's motivations, and my god, this is a good storyline. I mean, if you're someone who's ever been lucky enough to have a pet before, then you know exactly the kind of pain Arvin is in here. I have to imagine most people who have had one in their life would go through the same effort Arvin does in finding the Herba Mystica, if such a thing existed, in order to make their pal feel even a little bit better. The emotions he displays when Mabostiv opens his eyes are genuinely heartwarming, and that's not something you tend to experience very often in a Pokemon game. To me it seems that Pokemon are now 2 for 2 with great storylines in both Legends Arceus and Scarlet and Violet, so let's hope that this kind of storytelling continues. Anyway, let's move on to the next badge, where we were finally able to take on our first Team Star base at the instruction of a mysterious figure named Cassiopeia, who seemingly wants to see the end of Team Star. So here's how these bases work. First you defeat whoever's standing guard outside the gates in a regular battle, and then once inside, you use the auto battle feature to beat up 30 of Team Star's Pokemon, which draws the attention of the leader who'll battle you for real. I actually really enjoy this, even if it is pretty easy, just because it's something different to the usual battle format. I was never really a fan of the parts of Pokemon where it was just a slog of opposition grunts on your way to the leader. Here's looking at you, that one base in Mahogany Town in Gold and Silver. Anyway, the first of Team Star's bosses is a man named Giacomo who uses Dark-type Pokemon. He led with a Pawnyard, and I accidentally led with Yelena, as I didn't realise that you don't get the chance to swap your party around before challenging the leader. Oops. I swapped into Agatha, who was able to get one Incinerate off to bring it real low on HP, but she was outsped and taken down by a couple of Fury Cutters. Damn. That was unfortunate, but it did actually present a great opportunity, as I was able to send Yelena back out onto the field. She was able to outspeed Pawnyard with a Fury Cutter of her own to take it out, and when the Starmobile entered the field with Intimidate, it actually activated her Defiant ability, raising her attack instead. It couldn't really do much to Yelena, so we kept up the Fury Cutter frenzy, and after a couple brought it low on HP, Yelena was able to hang on with over half HP remaining and take it down with a final attack. She was amazing in that battle. 
Now, each time that you defeat a Team Star boss, there's a flashback where you get to learn more about that character, as well as the team and its motivations as a whole. These are pretty interesting, and combined with the investigations by Clive the student who is totally not Director Clavel, it paints an intriguing picture of the real story behind Team Star. I think rather than reviewing them one by one though, I'll cover their overall story at the end of their storyline, once we have all of the pieces in hand. Before I went back to shiny hunting, I wanted to earn one more badge by defeating Iono of the Lavincia Gym, and on our travels we had a key evolution for the upcoming battle, as Agatha evolved into a Houndoom. That is a pretty incredible shiny, and the timing of this couldn't have been more perfect, because I didn't really have much on my team at this stage that would be useful against her electric types, so I just needed some power instead. Oh, as a side note, you'll also see that I finally got rid of that hat and bought some proper clothing. I can't tell you how much that hat annoyed me, so I honestly don't know how I lasted that long with it on. Anyway, starting the battle, we led with Natasha against Iono's Wattrel, as I knew she wouldn't be much used later on anyway, but surprisingly she managed to take it out with two bubble beams, which was a great start. This was however short-lived, as Iono sent out Bellybolt next, who managed to take out not only Natasha in a single hit, but also Pepper on the next turn, after she got some chip damage in. Brutal, but expected. Luckily, I'd been saving the ace up my sleeve that was Agatha for this point in the battle anyway, who was able to use Nasty Plot twice to increase her special attack to plus 4, and then take out Bellybolt with a single incinerate. Her Luxio met the exact same fate on the turn it came in to add insult to injury, and then finally, Iono sent out and terastalized her Miss Magus. To hopefully give us a little extra power, I also terastalized Agatha into a pure fire type, and amazingly, a single incinerate was enough to take it down and win us the gym badge. Damn, Agatha was unmatched in that battle, and I'm confident in saying we'd have easily lost if it wasn't for that evolution. I'd already planned to return to shiny hunting after that badge, but I think it proved exactly how much we needed some new team members. Funnily enough, the first shiny I found at this stage took me completely by surprise, and that's because I was just running around the west province, collecting items and seeing what kind of Pokemon spawned in, when this shiny Drifloon popped up out of nowhere. How cool. I unfortunately already used a shiny Drifloon in my Legends Arceus run, so while this is an awesome shiny, I'm going to box it for this challenge, but at least it's one more for the raffle. Funnily enough, the second shiny I found was also kind of random, but not in the way that you would think. On the 19th of September 2023, I loaded Scarlet up to an undeniable sign of what I had to hunt for next, a mass outbreak of Rockruff right where I'd last closed the game. Because this is a method we hadn't tried before, I was really curious to see how it worked and how it compared to the other methods we'd used so far, so let's talk about how they function. You'll definitely have heard of mass outbreaks before, because they're not a new concept to Pokemon, and they were a really great way to hunt for shinies in Legends Arceus, but they do work a little differently in this game compared to that one. In Scarlet and Violet, mass outbreaks appear randomly each day across the map, and can spawn around 100 to 120 Pokemon overall. If you defeat or capture 30 of those Pokemon and see this message appear on screen, then the odds of a Pokemon appearing as shiny in that same outbreak will be boosted to 1 in 2048. And if you defeat or capture 60 Pokemon in an outbreak and see this message appear on screen, then the odds are boosted even further to 1 in 1365, which is 3 times the base odds. To make this even better, the outbreak isn't limited to 120 Pokemon in the sense that you only get 120 chances for a Pokemon to be shiny. If you stop battling or capturing Pokemon after you hit 60, you can literally just walk far enough away so the current set despawns, and then walk back into the outbreak area and gain a whole new set of spawns, all at the boosted odds. Which is incredible. It's worth noting that some people prefer to set up a picnic and then dismantle it rather than run around like I do, but I didn't find that to be very efficient as Pokemon seemed to spawn much slower if I just stood in one spot as opposed to consistently running around. You do you though. Overall, the only real downside to this process is that you need to find your shiny before the clock ticks over to the next day, otherwise the outbreaks will reset and all of your progress will be lost. So with this in mind, here's how the hunt for Rockruff went. I first used the auto battle feature to knock out 65 Rockruff, 
just to be safe and then began to ride around this entire area, all the while keeping an eye out for the Pokemon equivalent of Bluey. The difference between Rockruff's Shiny and the regular versions are substantial, but I was still a little worried that I wouldn't see this one due to its size. And after about an hour of roaming around, I still hadn't found our Shiny Doggo, but I did come across this. A random 1 in 4096 full odds Shiny Mankey. That one caught me off guard, and to be honest, I'm surprised that I even noticed it. I nicknamed her Hope, and even though she wasn't a planned addition to the team, I had a feeling she'd be pretty useful, especially with some of the battles we had coming up. This one ironically gave me hope that if I could see a shiny monkey, I would definitely be able to see a shiny Rockruff, and so it was back to riding around. After only one more hour of searching, I finally found what I was looking for, and damn, that is an awesome shiny. In addition to that, Rockruff has a really unique evolutionary line where it can become one of three different forms. If you evolve it during the daytime, it'll become the midday form, and if you evolve it in the evening, it'll become the midnight form. But it also has a special dusk form that I would love to get that can only be obtained if your Rockruff has the ability Own Tempo. I nicknamed ours Steve and went straight to check his ability, which was... Keen Eye. Ah well, you can't win them all and at least the adamant nature is really good for a rock rough. It also only took us two hours to find that shiny, and I had a feeling that that was probably longer than most mass outbreaks would take us, so I decided to take a look around for a few others. I travelled around for a little while to see what we had, and finally came across this one just outside of Porto Marinada, which turned out to be a Finizen outbreak. Whoa! I love Palafin's design and the fact that it becomes this super power Pokemon after switching out so I knew immediately that I had to add this to our team. So once again, we knocked out around 65 Finizen to be safe and then began to surf around in search of our shiny. Now, this one was really fast, but the only downside to this hunt which made it somewhat tedious was that the waterfall in this area made everything super laggy, and that meant searching for our shiny was just a little bit frustrating. All of my movements felt really slow, and it's things like this that are so sad with Paldea, because it could arguably be the best Pokemon game that's ever been released if it just functioned properly. For me, I never experienced any bugs, but lag like this was something that popped up fairly regularly throughout my adventure, which is a real shame. Anyway, after just 40 minutes of surfing around in our second fastest shiny hunt so far, minus the lag, our finism popped up right below the waterfall, and you can see my panic set in trying to chase it. God, I love this shiny. I nicknamed our finism Tony, and that concludes our latest and probably fastest round of shiny hunting so far, because now we've got a few more badges to earn. With our new team in hand, we headed straight for the next team starbase to take on Mela, who specialises in fire types, and along the way Steve evolved into the midday form of Lycanroc. Wow, that's a beautiful shiny. I chose the midday form over the midnight mainly due to its high attack and speed which just seemed like a better option at the time, and it would pay out in the long run, trust me. Anyway, after defeating 30 of Team Star's Pokemon, Mela emerged and led with her Torkoal, and I led with Yelena. I went for a Torment on the first turn, and it went for, ooh, Flame Wheel, but Yelena luckily dodged it and remained at full HP. On turn 2, we went for foul play while it couldn't hurt us thanks to Torment, as Yelena is immune to its only other move, which is Clear Smog. We kept using foul play, and because it had to alternate between Flame Wheel and a move that had no effect on us, Yelena was able to take down her Torkoal with minimal HP remaining. Amazing! She was taken down by the Starmobile on the following turn, but that was okay as she'd already been great in this battle. I sent Steve out next, and while he was able to bring it really low through using Rock Tomb a few times, he just fell short of knocking it out in the end, and was also taken down. Thankfully, Tony could come in next to avenge him with one Aqua Jet and win us the battle, so Mela was defeated, and that's another badge down. Our next stop was taking down Titan number 3 with Arvin, so I headed there immediately, and along the way, Hope evolved into a beastly primate. That's yet another great shiny, and it came at the perfect time given that Orthworm is a steel type. I knew hope would come in handy. To get there, we just had to travel through the desert area in the East Province, and... Wait, is that a shiny Cufant? No way. That was a totally random 1 in 4096 odds find, when I was literally just trying to find where the Titan was on the map. Brilliant. <laughs> 
In hindsight though, I'm kind of a monster. I knew I wouldn't have much use for it, but I still caught it. So this poor Cufant just got scooped up out of its natural habitat and immediately stuffed into the PC. Hopefully whoever wins the raffle will be kind to it. Anyway, we headed onwards to find Orthworm, and this was probably the easiest battle yet. In the first stage I sent out Hope, who was able to use Bulk Up once before decimating it with a single cross chop. She is powerful. After chasing it through a tunnel, Arvin linked up with us and Hope once again reigned supreme. A couple of cross chops brought it real low and then a seismic toss finished it off, with Hope losing virtually no HP. Whoa. That's probably the easiest badge we'll earn in this entire challenge, and the subsequent sandwich not only unlocks Coriden's ability to jump super high, which I found to be really useful, but also unlocks another really wholesome moment between Mabostiff and Arvin. This storyline is definitely my favourite so far. Moving on, our next badge could be obtained over in Kaskarafa, is that right? Where we could take on Kofu, the water type gym leader. I sent out Yelena to start against his Veluza, and she was once again great in this battle, taking it down with a couple of foul plays before sadly falling against his Wug Trio. Valkyrie was up next though, and she managed to take Wug Trio down with just a couple of plucks, so things were really looking to be in our favour. But then came Crabominable. This thing is powerful. It took Valkyrie out in one hit after terrestrializing, and given the poor type matchups I have, it looks like we're in a tough spot, but I did have a plan. I sent Tony out, who can't really do much to Crabominable in the way of damage, but it can harshly lower its attack with Charm until it was at minus 6. As a result, it struggled to whittle Tony down, and by the time he was taken out, Crabominable itself was at half HP from chip damage, and still had an extremely lowered attack stat so I could send Agatha out to finish this. I taught her the TM for Thunderfang, and the first hit brought it extremely low on HP, but also got the flinch. That's it. Game over. I used Incinerate on the next turn for the increased accuracy, and Kofu was defeated. That was a really fun battle, and I enjoyed using Tony to really make Crabominable useless, as opposed to having a Pokemon just one hit KO it. Anyway, the next badge we need is earned by defeating Atticus, the third Team Star boss who uses Poison-type Pokemon, and I absolutely love the way this guy speaks. We're just this unassuming 10-year-old in the Pokemon world, and he's over here calling us a scoundrel and a villainous wretch. It's hilarious. He leads with a Skun Tank to start, and so I sent out Agatha. The plan here was to use Nasty Plot right off the bat to raise our special attack by two stages, while he went for Toxic. Fortunately, I'd anticipated this and gave Agatha a Petcha Berry to cure the poison, so on the following turn we could once again use Nasty Plot, knowing that he'd probably waste another turn going for Toxic. Hilariously, Agatha then expelled the poison as part of the friendship mechanics anyway, so we could once again use Nasty Plot on the next turn to be at plus 6 special attack, as he just used Venishock. A single Incinerate then took Skuntank down, and the same went for his Rev of Room on the following turn. Awesome. Muck came out next, and he actually managed to hang on with very little HP remaining, but he could only bring Agatha into the yellow, so one more incinerate knocked him out too. The Starmobile was up next, and I wrongly assumed that we'd be able to outspeed it, so I terrestrialized and went for incinerate, but it actually outsped us and Agatha went down. Oh god, I should have seen that coming. I sent Tony out next in a desperate attempt to lower its attack with Charm, and he did manage to do that once, but then fell on the next turn. Valkyrie then managed to lower its speed a couple of times with Scurry Face, but she was also taken down before long. Uh oh. Hope was up next, and because the Starmobile had lowered speed, it tried to use Flame Charge in an attempt to boost it back to normal, so I started to use Bulk Up. Hope did start to whittle it down, but unfortunately between poison damage and regular attacks, she was also taken out by the Starmobile. Damn, the tides turned so quickly in this battle. I was sweeping with Agatha one minute, and the next I was down to my final two Pokemon. Thankfully, Steve was able to come out next, and with a few Rock Tombs, finally take this thing down. Whew, get me out of here. I think this battle just encapsulates exactly why I don't do Nuzlocks or those kinds of things, because I'm just not built for it. I like having fun and telling the story of my adventure, but I am no Nuzlocker, that's for sure. 
At the very least, this battle did make me think a little about what improvements I should start making, as up to this point I'd just been using the Pokemon's default moves and not really doing any EV training. But that would change soon enough, and I promised that I started to come up with some better strategies for the endgame. I wanted to earn one more gym badge before going back to shiny hunting or improving the team's move pools though, so we headed straight to Medali to take on a fan favourite gym leader, Larry, who specialises in normal types, at least for now. This one went somewhat smoother as I led with Hope and he led with Kamala. I used bulk up on the first turn as it did well over half HP damage in return with a single slam. That is powerful. I took it down on the following turn with a cross chop though and then when the Dunsparce came out I went for another but it must have survived on like 1 HP and so it took Hope out with a Hyper Drill. I think only being able to use bulk up just the once really hurt us though. Yelena came out next and was left on just 27 HP from another De Dunsparce Hyper Drill, but did manage to take it down with a foul play. Nice. When Staraptor came out, its Intimidate activated her Defiant ability and raised her attack, and while she did hang on from a facade on 2 HP, Metal Claw didn't really do much damage, so she fainted on the following turn. Steve once again came out to do some avenging and he brought it low with a rock tomb before terrestrializing to ensure the KO on the next turn with a final rock tomb. Even that badge didn't go entirely according to plan but at least it was smooth enough. Now I realise that we've just spent a lot of time battling and talking about the badges so you'll be pleased to hear that we've now got a nice break as we go back to shiny hunting for some new team members. First up was a Pokemon that I had been looking forward to finding a shiny of ever since I saw its new evolution reform within these games, and that's Girafferig. It's always been such a cool Pokemon, but its new evolution, for Giraffe honestly looks like it could be one of my new favourites in the whole franchise. I'm talking top 10 at least. I also took a trip to Chester Zoo in the UK the week before I started this challenge and got a picture with its real life counterpart. After that, I just had to find one. Now, we hadn't tried this particular trick yet, but you can actually time skip on your Nintendo Switch to reset the mass outbreaks across the map, essentially meaning that you can find an outbreak of literally whatever Pokemon you want if you have enough patience to continuously skip until you find that outbreak. And for our purposes, I'm absolutely going to allow it. For some of these time skips, I had to fast forward something ridiculous like 5 months, one day at a time, just to find the outbreak that I wanted, and I headed into this challenge wanting to specifically compare the different methods, but still use Pokemon that I genuinely want on my team. Now that we're comparing how efficient the mass outbreaks are to the random encounters, it seems okay to me to time skip to find Pokemon that I would like to do that with. So with all that said, we did the usual and knocked out 65 Girafferig and then began to look around for our shiny form. This one's not too subtle but not too clear either, so I had to concentrate pretty intensely to find it, and after about 2 hours of running around this area, we got it. Not only that, but after catching our shiny and nicknaming him Scott, Valkyrie evolved into a gorgeous Corviknight. That is another shiny that I adore, it just looks so good in this game. Our next hunt followed the exact same format as Girafferig. I'd initially time skip to find it and then do the usual when it comes to boosting the odds, but this time I did it just for fun. The Pokemon I wanted to hunt for wasn't going to be in my team, but it's a really cool shiny and whoever wins the raffle I'm sure will appreciate it. Sandygast and Palosan's shiny forms are instantly recognisable as they're based on black sand beaches, so they're basically the complete opposite of their regular forms. I mean just look at how distinct this is compared to the others, and how awesome that blue accent is against the black. Wonder only took around half an hour to find too, including the time skipping, so it was a quick and fun shiny hunt. Coincidentally, the next two Pokemon I wanted to hunt for were also ghost types, although one of those has many forms which remove that typing. Can you guess what it is? Yep, that's right, Rotom was next on my list. It's undoubtedly one of the coolest Pokemon that's ever existed, and I always remember wanting to find one in Legends Arceus, but just never actually committing to it, so I was extremely happy with this find. It was once again obtained in a mass outbreak through time skipping, which only took about one hour to find in total, but this was a really intense hour, as you can see how tiny Rotom is, so I had to look real close at all times, otherwise I'd have missed it. 
I nicknamed him Thor, and he would definitely be joining the team, although I hadn't quite decided which form he would take yet. My final hunt before continuing with the story was to find a Pokemon that I've always thought was underrated when it comes to design, and that's Bayonet. It hasn't appeared in recent games, and I always thought that was strange, so I wanted to capitalise on its appearance here by finding and evolving a Shuppet. This hunt was slightly gruelling though, as I learned something the hard way. That is, when you're hunting for a Pokemon in an outbreak that only appears at night time, the outbreak will still show on the map during the daytime, but that Pokemon won't be there. That means that you've got to wait around for 30 minutes or so until it turns to night time again and then carry on hunting. I'm pretty sure that as long as it's still the same date in real life that the outbreak started on, that your boosted odds remain the same once you've knocked 30 or 60 plus of the Pokemon out, but yeah, this one took a little bit longer because of this. After 5 hours of real life time, 2.5 hours of that in the daytime where Shuppet didn't spawn, and 2.5 hours of that at night time when it did spawn, we finally found our little green ghost Pokemon, and he looks awesome. I nicknamed him Sam, and with that we could close off our recent round of shiny hunting and get to work on evolving and improving the team. I purchased the Rotom catalog from Meatball Marinara's auction house, I mean uh, Porto Marinara's auction house, and transformed Thor into a freezer, which is probably not his best form, but it was one that I personally wanted. I really love the design of this one. Sam then evolved into a bayonet, a really cool shiny, and like I mentioned earlier, for sure an underrated Pokemon. Scott evolved into a Ferrigiraf, and man, this might be my favourite of them all. The design and colours are 10 out of 10 for sure. Tony's evolution was a little more complicated, as I had to find someone through Discord to temporarily join my world while I levelled Finizen up. Thanks so much to Guy who joined my game and made this possible. Palafin is such a cool shiny, and I couldn't have done it otherwise, so I'm really grateful for the help on this one. With all of those evolutions complete, it was time to take on Rhyme, the gym leader who specialises in ghost-type Pokemon. This one is a trek up Glaciado Mountain, but I had a lot of fun in this battle once it got going. Although, Pokemon once again falls victim to its lack of voice acting. It's so hard to get engaged in a scene where someone is singing or rapping, when there are no words coming out of the mouth. It just looks dumb. Rhyme battles in the doubles format, so I worked out a fun strategy and kitted our team out with new items and moves, and as a result it all worked out really well. I led with Sam and Tony, and Tony used Flip Turn to return to my party and break Mimikyu's disguise, while Sam could use Phantom Force with increased speed due to his newly attached Choice Scarf to vanish for this turn. I then sent Scott out in Tony's place, and because his ability, Armor Tail, prevents the use of priority moves, on the following turn both Mimikyu and Bayonet failed with Shadow Sneak, while Sam obliterated Bayonet in return with Phantom Force. A great start, and Scott was also able to start setting up with Calm Mind on this turn. On the following turn, Mimikyu's Shadow Sneak failed once again, and Sam was locked into Phantom Force so he vanished. One Twin Beam from Scott then took Mimikyu down, which was great, but Houndstone unfortunately used Phantom Force too, so Sam's move would miss on the next turn. Rhyme sent out Toxtricity to replace Mimikyu and terastalized it, and because Houndstone vanished after Sam, his move indeed missed, and as predicted, he was taken down. Scott then retaliated with a Twin Beam, which nearly took Toxtricity down, but it managed to hang on with a fraction of its HP remaining. Thankfully though, I was able to send Tony back onto the field, and his zero to hero form activated, so one jet punch took her star Pokemon down, while Scott held out from a Houndstone Crunch, and brought it to about half HP with another Twin Beam. Another jet punch from Tony brought her last Pokemon incredibly low, but it hung on and unfortunately took Scott down with one more Crunch. Oh, he was so useful in that battle that he really deserved to survive until the end. Steve came out in his place, and at this point it was already over, as a priority sucker punch could defeat Rhyme's last Pokemon and win us the badge. That was maybe my favourite battle so far. Speaking of which, it's time to move on to my favourite Titan so far, and that's Great Tusk, the paradox form of Domphan. This thing is huge, and I really love its design, it's top notch. This thing is a physical attacker, so our best counter was undoubtedly Valkyrie and she was amazing. 
Because Valkyrie's got such great defences, I gave her the Rocky Helmet to hold for the remainder of the run, and this is a really useful item which deals recoil damage to anything that makes physical contact with her. In Stage 1, she was able to use Iron Defence a few times to max out her defence stat, all the while not taking too much damage, and brought it to half HP with the Rocky Helmet alone. One body press brought it low, and then the Rocky Helmet finished it off. Easy. In Stage 2, Arvin joined us once more, and we used Iron Defence a few times to max out our defence, so it really couldn't do much to us, and even when it did land a hit, it was probably taking more damage back from the Rocky Helmet than it was dealing to us. After Scoville and helped out a little, one more body press was enough to defeat the Quaking Earth Titan, and you know what that means. Sandwich time. This run unlocks Koraiden's ability to glide through the air, and man, I had been looking forward to this one. Mainly just to see Paldea from a new perspective, you know? It's not quite like the soaring mechanic in Oras, but it's along those lines where you could genuinely spend time just soaring around looking at stuff. For now though, we've got another badge to earn, this time in Alphanada, and this town has some really cool features. If you're an oldie Pokemon player like me, you'll remember that these were the sprites you'd see in the Generation 1 games for some of the Pokemon, which I thought was a really nice touch. The gym leader of this town is Tulip, who specialises in psychic types, but they were no match for the powerhouse that Steve had become at this point. He was already a Pokemon with high attack and speed, but I'd given him the loaded dice item which increases the number of hits a multi-use move will get in one turn, and taught him the move Rock Blast. See where I'm going with this? I lived with him against Ferrigiraf, and he managed to use Bulk Up just a few times before removing it from the field with a single Rock Blast. Whoa, this is a good tactic. Her Gardevoir came out next, but it too fell to a single Rock Blast, and her Espathra met the same fate when it came onto the field on the following turn. Lodges was up next, and I don't think I need to tell you that it too fell to a single Rock Blast from Steve, but it did. Damn, he was unreal in that battle. I mean, that was almost too easy. My guide said that we were off to battle the final gym leader next, which felt pretty surreal, but Paldea doesn't really have much filler in it. You have a lot to do in terms of the amount of badges, but it's all pretty efficient. Like, remember in other games when you'd have a task to complete, but there'd be no significance to it, it was just something you had to do? I never really felt like that was the case in this game. Everything felt like it had a purpose and joined together to contribute to the overall story and journey, and I really enjoyed that aspect. Anyway, the Ice-type gym leader Grusha was our final test before the Pokemon League, but thankfully this one was another easy battle. I led with Tony, and he led with Frostmoth, and we went with a flip turn to start so that we could activate Tony's hero form on re-entry. I sent Thor out in his place, and he just about held on with 3 HP from the next two turns to get a light screen up, before finally being taken down. That was okay though, as my plan was always to use Tony anyway. A single Iron Head took Frostmoth down on the following turn, and when Burtick came in, even if it managed to tank a couple of moves, whatever damage it did to us through Earthquake was almost entirely healed with Dream Punch. Which is such an overpowered move for Palafin to learn by the way. I mean, it already has insane attack and speed, and you give it a HP recovery move? That's crazy. Sitaitan came out next, and the exact same thing happened. It tanked a Dream Punch on half HP, and responded with Ice Spinner, but on the following turn, another Drain Punch took it down and brought us back to full HP like nothing had happened. Altaria was his final Pokemon, and despite its efforts of terrestrialization, one Iron Head brought it below half HP before he missed with a Hurricane, and a final Drain Punch knocked it out. You know what? That one might have been the easiest battle of the entire run. Palafin is just an insane Pokemon. Now, before we headed off to earn our next badge, I wanted to find a few more shinies to round off the challenge. This wouldn't be the last time we hunted for shinies during the video, so be sure to stick around until the very end for a little surprise, but there were one or two that I wanted to hunt at this point, either for our team or just for fun. First up was a really special one. I wanted to do something different than the usual mass outbreaks or random encounters, and I found what might be the most unique way of shiny hunting in this game, which is to find an alternate form of Vivion. If you didn't already know about Vivion, it has a ton of different forms that can be obtained which change the colours and patterns on its wings. In Paldea the standard spawns are locked to the fancy pattern, but you can use postcards from Pokemon Go to change that. 
If you have a Pokemon Go account, you can add friends from all over the world, and depending on their region, any postcard you receive and pin to your postcard book from them will correspond to a certain pattern of Vivion within the game. I'll show you how this works now, but you basically link your Switch to your Pokemon Go account and then send across a postcard from your book, which changes the patterns of Vivion in your game for 24 hours to whatever form that postcard corresponds to. In my case, the postcard I sent across was from a specific part of the US that gave us the ability to find a modern Vivion, which is exactly what I wanted. The trick now though was finding one within 24 hours. So I set to work on making a level 2 bug encounter sandwich, and then rode around the south province in an area that I found spawned the most scatterbugs. I wanted to hunt these instead of Vivion because they're much easier to spot, and there are just so many that appear in this area. After a long and boring 2.5 hours, I did find a shiny, but it wasn't the one I wanted. We've already got one of you, get in the box. Half an hour later though, Awesome. Now we just had to be sure that the postcard worked properly. I leveled Janet up until she could evolve and... Yes, it worked. Doing hunts like this always make me nervous as to whether I've followed the correct instructions, so I was relieved to say the least when I saw that wing pattern. The modern one in particular looks fantastic. My next hunt saw a return to, surprise surprise, mass outbreaks, as I wanted to add a Pokemon I've always loved but rarely used to the team. A Torko. Thankfully, it's pretty easy to spot this shiny, but they did mess up the appearance of this one, because if the camera is just a little too far away from a Torko, it looks like this. Oh well. Steven would definitely be joining the team in place of Sam, and yes, I know I've got two Stevens now on the team, but they are different. Vastly different if you think about their namesakes. The final hunt I wanted to do was another just for fun, and that's Surviper. I would have loved to have one on the team, but my current members are just too cool for me to box any of them, so this one's purely an extra for the giveaway. I started the usual process on a mass outbreak, and about halfway through I hilariously found a fantastic but unexpected shiny in the form of a Luxio. I used a Luxray in my Legends Arceus video, so similarly to Drifloon, this one will be going in the box, but man, that is a cool shiny. Anyway, considering that this was a mass outbreak, Surviper took longer than usual, clocking in at around 3 hours. It's crazy that that's considered slow in this game, like, I, d I don't know how I'm going to cope when we get to BDSP or Sword and Shield compared to how much easier it's been in these games. It'll be fun but a very different experience, and I'm curious to see how much more rewarding it is. So, this is our team heading into the final sections of the game, and damn, I am proud of it. With another shiny hunting session done, it was now time to move on to the penultimate Team Star base where we could take on Ortega, a fairy type specialist. His first Pokemon is an Azumarill, so I led with Torkoal, who has such a useful ability, Drought. That set up the sun, and in turn gave us single turn solar beams for a while, so his Azumarill really didn't last long. Wigglytuff was up next, and I figured that I'd just keep on going, so another few solar beams took that down too although Steven was left on pretty low HP for his troubles. When Darkspun came out, I switched into Tony, purely to use a flip turn and get his hero form set up, and then I sent out Valkyrie. I used Iron Defense a couple of times to limit any damage dealt to us, and then started to whittle it down with Steel Wing, while it took recoil damage from the Rocky Helmet on any physical move that it used. It didn't take long to take it down, and Valkyrie was nearly at full HP still when that happened, so this was looking good. The Starmobile was up next though, and these things are pretty tough, so we'll see. A lot of turns went by here, but the main thing to note is that because our defence was maxed out, it couldn't really do much damage to Valkyrie. After a lot of back and forth, Valkyrie finally took it down with Body Press, and it's safe to say that she's become an absolute powerhouse since evolving. Now, I know that I said I'd cover the Team Star story a little later on, but we do learn some really interesting things about them here, so let's review a little bit. Team Star are originally painted as this band of students that don't attend classes at the academy, pressure others into joining them, and have overall become a problem that the director himself is looking into. But there's a lot more to them than that. 
We've had sprinkles of information throughout that Team Star was founded to combat bullying within the Academy, but it's confirmed here that the faculty weren't really doing anything to help those who were being bullied, and one member even erased all information on the incident to avoid any backlash, further solidifying that Team Star are actually a good set of kids. This group of people who were bullied or ostracised all came together to combat that evil and flush it out of the academy for good, but also boost each other's self-esteem and give others like them a safe haven. It's a nice change from a villainous group that are just pure evil or out for themselves, and you can really understand their perspective on why they've behaved this way. I know that they don't want to return to the Academy out of the promise they made to Cassiopeia, or from loyalty to one another, but also to them the Academy is just a place that never had their back, so why would they want to return to it? It's another fantastic storyline. Speaking of fantastic storylines, it's time to take on the final Titan Pokemon over at Casaroya Lake. Stage 1 was super easy, as Thor used Volt Switch to take over half of its HP away, and then when Steven came in and set up the sun, a single solar beam finished it off. After following it to another part of the lake, Arvin joined us and we could take it down once more. Thor again used Volt Switch on the first turn to deal a good amount of damage, and then on the following turn, Steven came in and used Solar Beam to bring it low, before Arvin's Greedent finished it off with a takedown. Damn, that was fast. Tatsugiri was up next, and this one was a little more difficult, but we got there in the end. Thorvolt switched into Scott this time, and between our Psychics and Greedent's takedowns, we eventually defeated the Titan and could find the final Herba Mystica. The resulting sandwich now lets Coridon climb up walls, which is pretty cool, but in even better news, Mabostiff is now back to his normal self, which is so wholesome to see. Unfortunately for Arvin though, this is a little short-lived, as Professor Seda calls and asks for him to let us into the lighthouse on Poco Path. I don't think I've mentioned this, but Seda is Arvin's mother, and she's more than a little neglectful of him. As he himself points out, this is the first time he's heard from her in a long time, and the first thing she asks of him isn't whether he's okay, or even an apology for not being around much, it's to ask him for a favour. I know that we find the reason for this strange behaviour to be that she's AI later on, but given that Arvin sees this as typical behaviour from his mother, I don't think the real Seda was ever that good of a parent to him either. Arvin might be the saddest character in this game in a lot of ways. He's only a child, yet his mother consistently abandons him in the name of research, and his only friend really is Mabostiv until we come along, who was in poor health for quite some time from the sounds of it. He has the weight of the world on his shoulders for such a young age, and yet nobody to help him navigate it. Anyway, before we finish that storyline up, it was time to head over to the final Team Star base where we could take on Eri, a fighting type specialist. This whole area is probably my favourite in all of Paldea. That is a beautiful setting. Now the battle itself was a real cakewalk with Scott the Perigera, but let's go over why. She leads with a Toxic Rook, which is a big threat to us with Sucker Punch, but if we don't attack and waste all of its PP, it can't really do anything. With that in mind, I kept using Agility so that Scott would outspeed everything on her team throughout the battle, and once it had used Sucker Punch 5 times, we could take it down with a single Psychic while remaining at full HP. When Lucario came out, it took a couple of Psychics to take it down, but we hung on with around half HP, so things were looking good. Persimion fell to a single Psychic when it entered the field, and then Aerie sent out Annihilate, which hung on with barely any HP left from a Psychic, before bringing Scott to just 27 HP with a close combat. Luckily though, I detached a Berry to Scott, which restored some HP, and another Psychic took it down on the following turn. Whew. The Starmobile was up next, and a Psychic brought it to around half HP before it landed a Combat Torque, and got the Paralysis. Damn. I wasn't sure if we'd be able to outspeed now, but I rolled the dice anyway with one final psychic, and we not only outsped, but also got a high roll and took it down. Wow. Scott was amazing in that battle, and that's a few badges now where we've been able to sweep an opponent with a single Pokemon. With that done, we could now meet Cassiopeia at the Academy and put an end to Team Star, but before we get to that, let's go and take on the Pokemon League. It's strange walking into the Elite Four and being presented with a quiz, but I love it. 
It feels like something that absolutely should be going on across the regions, as opposed to the usual, oh, have you, uh, have you got all eight badges there? Oh, cool, cool. Uh, no, that's it. You can just go in. Just through that door over there. All right, see you later. The ground type specialist and interviewer we just met, Rika, was up first, and so I led with Tony to get a flip turn off and set up his hero form just in case. I sent Steven out in his place, and a single solar beam took Wishcash out, although he was left on low HP from an earth power. Domfang came in next and nearly fell to one solar beam, but stood the barrage on like 10 HP and took Steven down with one earthquake. Damn. I sent Scott out next as he knew Energy Ball, so he took Domfan out with that, and also dug Trio on the next turn. Camerupt was up next and two Psychics took it down, but it did put us to sleep by using Yawn. Claude Sire was Rika's final Pokemon and she terrestrialized it into a ground type, but even once Scott woke up and used Energy Ball, it wasn't doing much damage to it. Because of that I switched into Tony, whose hero form activated and gave him a huge boost in power. Claude Sire couldn't do much to him and he kept recovering HP with Drain Punch anyway, so a couple took it down and won us the battle. A nice start to the Elite Four. Poppy was up next and she uses Steel types, so this one was fun, as I led with Steven who could set up the sun to boost our fire type moves. A single flamethrower removed Copper Raja from the field, and when Bronzong came out in its place it met the exact same fate. The same thing happened to Corviknight on the next turn, and although Magnazone did manage to hold on thanks to its use of light screen, it was short lived and one more flamethrower took it down on the following turn. Tinkerton was a bit tougher and it seemed to resist Torkoal well, so I swapped into Valkyrie to get revenge for Corviknight's every work. Iron Defense gave us a boost to help us hold out, and then one body press took Tinkerton down and won us the battle. That one was super easy. Larry was up next, and he's changed his specialty to the flying type, so this one might be even easier given that we have Steve and his loaded dice rock blast combo. His Tropius fell to a single rock blast which hit four times, and his Strapta met the same fate even after lowering our attack with Intimidate. Altaria did manage to hang on but only took half of our HP away with the Dragon Pulse, and so it too went down on the following turn. Oricorio couldn't hold on from even one attack, and then when Flamigo came out, we got the 5 hits combo with Rock Blast, but it held on with a sliver of health remaining. No, I was gutted because Steve deserved to sweep after that performance. But, thankfully even after it used close combat, Steve toughed it out on 1 HP to take it down and finish the battle. Yes! Up next was Hassel, who is the Dragon type specialist of the Elite Four and probably the toughest of the lot. I sent Thor out first against his Noivern and he managed to use a light screen followed by Blizzard to take it down. He didn't have much HP left though and fell to his Haxorus on the following turn. I thought that I'd send Valkyrie out in his place to take this one on and holy crap I didn't realise how huge Corviknight is in comparison to Haxorus, that's crazy. We started to use Iron Defense, but after a couple of turns our HP was becoming low from the onslaught of attacks, so I finally used Body Press to take Haxorus down. Dragalge came out next, so Body Press wasn't doing that much damage, and it knows Thunderbolt. Uh oh. I thought Valkyrie's days were numbered, but thankfully a Brave Bird on the following turn took it down, although the recoil left us painfully low on HP. Flapple was up next, and a body press brought it extremely low, but it somehow hung on. I was sure the next move would take us out, but Valkyrie once again defied all odds and hung on with 10 HP remaining from Dragon Rush, as the Rocky Helmet recoil took Flapple down. Whew, the last few turns were a roller coaster. Unfortunately, this is where Valkyrie's streak ended though, as Baxcalibur could outspeed and take her down with an Icicle Crash. I sent Scott out next, and while he barely held on from a single Glaive Rush, Psychic wasn't a one-hit KO either, so he was taken out on the following turn. Thankfully, I did have an answer for this thing, as Steve is incredibly fast, so I sent him out next, and with the loaded dice item, there's no way Baxcalibur could hang on from even a single Rock Blast. That's the Elite Four defeated, and now we can move on to the champion, Gita. Gita is considered to be one of the weaker champions in the franchise, and after this battle, I can absolutely see why. Like, her team is composed well, but it's just laid out in the wrong order. 
She leads with an Espathra, so I sent out Thor to start, and a couple of Shadow Balls managed to take it down, with us being left at half HP. When Avalug came out, I switched into Valkyrie, who could boost her defense with a couple of iron defenses, and then take it out with a single body press. King Gambit was up next, and Valkyrie actually outsped, managing to take it down with body press on the very first turn. When Veluza came out, it couldn't hold on from a Brave Bird, and just like that, we were down to Gita's final two Pokemon. Gogo held on from a body press with a tiny amount of HP left, but only used bulk up, so one more took it out on the following turn, and then she sent in Glamora. She terastalizes this one into a rock type, but it really didn't matter at this point, as a single body press finished the battle and won us our champion status. That was anticlimactic, but it's not our fault that they designed her team so poorly. With that section complete, we could technically take on Nimona in our final rival battle, but before I did that, I wanted to head over to the Academy and wrap up Team Star's storyline. This video is already way too long as it is, so I'm not going to go over the Cassiopeia battles for the end of this arc, as they were both pretty easy, but I do want to talk a little about the conclusion of Team Star. Upon reaching the Academy, we're confronted by Clive, who reveals to us that he's actually... Director Clavel, obviously. He claims to be Cassiopeia, but if you've been paying attention throughout the story, it's clear that he's not. Once you've defeated him, he comes clean and admits that he just wanted to see if you were strong enough to take on the real Cassiopeia, and I've got to admit that I really like Clavel. He's an excellent leader, and there's not many people in his position who would take the time to investigate why Team Star are behaving like this. Most would just expel them and be done with it, but he seems to genuinely care about making things right. He might have threatened to expel them originally, but the investigation work and trying to see things from their point of view shows his true character, as well as his apology later on. Anyway, entering the yard, we find out that the real leader of Team Star is... Penny. Yeah, there were clues everywhere for this one. She'd always let the facade slip while giving us league points and materials after a mission, and say something just a little too revealing. And she's also a new student, which fits in nicely with the extended study break the former director gave her, so this one makes total sense. She has an extremely cool team of evolutions, but this was an easy enough battle in the end, so we'll skip over that. Now we get to see why Operation Starfall was enacted. So, Penny actually tried to tell the leaders to break up the band and return to school after the bullies were dealt with, but they didn't listen and instead waited eagerly for her return. And this makes sense, because not only was her goodbye kind of abrupt, but Team Star has a code that all members follow. And one of them is that they can't just order each other around. The only way around this was for Penny to find someone strong enough to defeat them, thereby forcing them to follow the code and stand down. A cool premise. They're such a close-knit group, and their intentions have always been meaningful, either trying to prevent bullying or just being loyal to the people that they care about. Every member has at some point or another told us that their friends are their greatest treasure, and that's a sentiment that the Academy urged its students to find way back at the beginning of our adventure, when we set out to journey across Paldea. It might not be the most difficult twist to predict, but it really is another home run for Pokemon's storytelling. And for us, it's the end of Starfall Street. With that done, we could now switch tracks and head over to Poco Path to join Arvin at the lighthouse, where we first met him. He pretty much confirms everything we've suspected so far about his relationship with Seda before we head inside, and she invites us down to the deepest depths of Area Zero, noting that we'd probably need another member or two to join us. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Arvin wanted a battle before venturing down there to see if we were both ready, but Steven swept most of his team, so there wasn't much to cover here. I will say that it's so cool to see my boss div back to full strength though, even if I did feel a little bad about taking it down in battle. That completes the Path of Legends storyline, and we've just got one more to round off now before we can finally make the journey to Area Zero. Our final battle in the Victory Road storyline is of course against Nimona, and this takes place amongst the bright lights of Mesa Goza, where it all started. I haven't talked much about Nimona or her battles, as she's a pretty straightforward character, but that doesn't mean that she's not a good one. Her whole purpose is to find someone who can really test her in battle, someone she can go all out against and still lose to, or struggle against. 
She might not be the most complicated of characters, but she's always happy and upbeat. She tries her best to be respectful of your time, even if she's a little overzealous when it comes to battling, and she knows exactly what she wants out of life. I think it's a nice contrast to the more complex storylines that Arvin and Penny have. The battle itself was fun too, and the setting is magnificent. To start, I led with Tony and she led with Lycanroc, and while it did manage to get a stealth rock up, a wave crash took it down on the next turn. When Paul Mott came out, I used Flip Turn to swap out and Steven came in next. Unfortunately though, between the stealth rock damage and double shock doing way more than I anticipated, Steven was taken down before he could do anything. Oops. I sent out Scott in his place, and while a close combat from Pormot did a lot of damage to us, one psychic thankfully took it down. The Dunsparce came out next, and after some back and forth, including Scott's berry activating to restore some HP, he managed to take the Dunsparce down with a final psychic on just 2 HP. Whoa. Orthworm was up next though, and Scott had done all he could, so I had to let him go to an earthquake. Tony came back onto the field in his hero form, and while it took a couple of turns to take it down with Drain Punch, each time he just kept recovering good amounts of HP, so when Orthworm was taken out, we were still looking good. Gudra was Nimona's next Pokemon, and this was a similar story, as we exchanged attacks with Tony consistently recovering HP each time through Drain Punch. A cool detail here though is that I brought it low enough on HP to use Flip Turn as our final move, meaning that Gudra was taken down and we could send a Pokemon of our choice out to face Hermiauscarada. Well, who else could I go with other than Valkyrie, our mascot for this challenge who has been consistently great throughout? Nimona terrestrialized her last Pokemon into a pure grass type as we went for a Brave Bird which took it down in a single hit. Amazing. With that we can round off the Victory Road storyline, and now there's just one more matter to deal with down in Area Zero, as we set out to complete the way home. After the group got acquainted, we jumped down into the great crater of Paldea on Coridon's back and landed in this paradise. It's filled with very strong creatures called Paradox Pokemon that were brought here from the past by Aseda's time machine, and after disabling locks within each research station on the way down, as well as battling both Wild and Paradox Pokemon along the way, we finally reached our destination, Seda's Lab. To get in, we had to defeat a few more Paradox forms, but that wasn't too much trouble, and once inside we learned the shocking truth that Seda is actually an AI and not the real Professor. The real Professor died a long time ago in Area Zero, protecting our Coridon from the more aggressive one or at least that's the impression I got. AI Seda has summoned us here because she wants us to destroy the time machine that brings these paradox forms into the present day. She'll answer all kinds of questions for you, but the only one that really matters is, why does she want us to destroy the time machine? Well, it turns out that the paradox forms actually cause terrible ecological damage to the current timeline, and if they keep being brought here, it could very well mean the end of Paldea as we know it. Interestingly enough, she mentions that the real Professor would have had a very relaxed attitude on this and actually allowed Paldea to be ruined, which to me says that even an AI form of her is a better parent for Arvin. She really wasn't a good person. She created the time machine and would have allowed everyone else to foot the bill for her mistakes, including her own son as some kind of life finds a way moment. Unfortunately though, AI Seder is programmed to prevent the very reality she wants to see happen, so we need to defeat her in one final battle. Let's do this. I led with Valkyrie as she led with Slitherwing, and we started off with the usual iron defense strategy, boosting to plus 6 and then knocking it out with a body press after it had already sustained damage from the rocky helmet. Fluttermane came out next and did massive damage with a Thunderbolt, as we did massive damage with a Heavy Slam in return. Unfortunately though, this thing outspeeds us, so Valkyrie went down to one more Thunderbolt on the next turn. Oh, what a loss. As it had low HP, I sent Tony out next to use Flip Turn and take it down, while activating his hero form for later and also giving us a clean switch. I sent Steven out in his place against Brute Bonnet, and while Earth Power did a lot of damage to us, Shell Smash could significantly boost both of our attack and speed stats, so one flamethrower eviscerated it on the next turn. 
I was hoping that his boosted speed would allow Steven to outspeed Sandy Shocks next, but it just wasn't enough and he was unfortunately taken out by a single power jam. Scott came out next and battled it out with Sandy Shocks, but despite his efforts, just fell short of knocking it out with a psychic and he too was defeated. This thing is strong. I sent Tony out in his place and thankfully one flip turn was able to take it down after Scott's efforts and give us a clean switch for the next turn. Thor was up next against her scream tail and it wasn't looking good for him as he was outsped each time and brought into the yellow, but on the last turn it went for a zen headbutt and missed, leaving Thor with the perfect opportunity to take it down with a final shadow ball. The luck was with us though. Cedar's final Pokemon is Roaring Moon, a huge threat. It took Thor out on its first turn with a Night Slash, and now I was down to my final two Pokemon, Tony and Steve. Pretty iconic and ironic given the naming convention. I sent Steve onto the field as I hoped that he'd be able to outspeed this thing, rolled the dice and I was right, a single play rough decimated Roaring Moon and won us the battle. Wow, that was an awesome last battle to round this journey off. There is another one to be had here between the Coridons, but for our purposes we've successfully beaten Pokemon Scarlet using only shiny Pokemon. What a journey. AI Seda decides to sacrifice herself to protect Paldea and we all walk off into the sunset as the game ends. But this video isn't quite over. Look, this was a really special challenge. I mean, it's the most shinies I've ever caught for a video. And to make the giveaway extra special and really say thank you to each and every one of you who has supported me in 2023, I wanted to do one last shiny hunt for a type of Pokemon that we haven't been able to find until now. Paradox Pokemon can only be shiny hunted within Area Zero once you've completed the game, and I couldn't think of a better way to round off this video than to find a couple. I started with Great Tusk, which is probably the poster child for Scarlet's Paradox forms, and it has an insanely cool shiny to boot. All I needed for this one was a level 2 fighting encounter sandwich and to journey down to this area right outside of Research Station 4, where there are tons of them. I knew that this wouldn't take me long given the sheer amount of spawns and after only 2 hours of repeating this I found exactly what I wanted, and man how awesome is this. You probably saw the mild panic that I experienced wondering whether it would fall over the edge, but we got it in the end. I'm not sure if Bruce is my absolute favourite shiny in the run, but it's definitely up there. Now, while Great Tusk was an easier version of a Paradox Pokemon to find, I also wanted to test out one of the more difficult ones. Specifically, the most difficult one, which is Roaring Moon. This one has limited spawns in a hidden cave, and whether you use a Dragon or Dark Encounter Sandwich, there are other Pokemon in here which correspond to those and make it more difficult to find increased spawns of Roaring Moon. Zwellus as an example has the exact same type in, and so you'll see lots of those alongside a few extra Roaring Moons, as opposed to seeing just Roaring Moon. Nevertheless, for this one I thought we'd try a method that we haven't tried before in using the level 3 sparkling power sandwiches, which boost your shiny odds to 1 in 1024. The creative mode sandwich I used also gave dragon encounter power level 3, and so this one was entirely geared towards finding Roaring Moon. Immediately after creating this sandwich we made our way down into area 0 and, well, it's better if you just see this one for yourself. My first visit to the cave were Roaring Moon spawns after making my very first level 3 sparkling power sandwich of the entire run yielded a shiny Roaring Moon. Unbelievable. This challenge is now officially complete and I could not have asked for a better ending to this video and to our journey across the Paldea region. Hello, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I know this video in particular has been like super long, so uh, I genuinely appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed it as well, even though it was ridiculously long. 
Also, this is the first time you see me, which is weird for me, but probably a lot weirder for you. I'm just popping this in here as like a last minute kind of thing at the end of the video, uh, for two reasons. First of all, I, it's because I'm getting married in December, um, so I'm going to be taking a little bit of a break. Uh, so just, just so you know, I'll probably only be back in like February, March time, because uh, the wedding's in December and then I'm on honeymoon in January. And then the other part of that is just to say thank you so much, like 2023 um, has been a year that I've never expected. I always wanted to do YouTube and, you know, interact with everyone and, and for everyone to really enjoy the stuff that I'm putting out. And it's, it seems like that's actually happening, which is just, <laughs> like, it's just so awesome. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that do thank you videos and things like that, but I really, really am super thankful. Like, it's not just like a, a token thank you. I genuinely am very happy with the way that the channel's gone this year. And, you know, it's given me a lot of motivation to keep shiny hunting, because you know that shiny hunting is sometimes difficult it's a little bit you've got to be patient so having everybody really enjoy the stuff that i'm putting out helps a lot with that i'm currently working on a brilliant diamond shining pearl shiny only run yeah i know that one's going to take me forever to do but um i'm thinking of doing some sort of like 24 hour straight shiny hunting videos like in legends arceus and um Scarlet and violet and things like that and just other fun videos that are like a little bit smaller uh, while I'm working on BDSP and, and in the future I'll probably do Sword and Shield as well. As you can understand they're not as easy um, as Scarlet Violet, Legends Arceus, Let's Go Pikachu. They're kind of taking me a lot longer to just find shinies in. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much everything from me. Like I said, if you've watched any of this video, but especially if you're at this point, and it's like an hour long. <laughs> Thank you so much. I genuinely appreciate it. And if you've supported me at all in 2023, same thing. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And I, I really hope that you know that. If you have watched this point, to this point in the video and you wouldn't mind just leaving a little comment, um, wishing me a, 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 you know, a good wedding, that'd be awesome. Just so I can show my, my wife because she'll be made up. And um, yeah, have a happy new year, everyone. I, I really can't wait to see you all again in the new year. Bye.